Welcome um, to DHC Year 2 uh, Preparation for Practice, Semester 2 of Year 2. I'm Sasha and I'll take you through the very last bits of DHC teaching for the second half of the year for second year. Alright, next slide is content. Um, not much to talk about for this part of the year, which is going to briefly cover systematic reviews um, and their appraisal, qualitative appraisals as well. We'll have one slide on immunizations just because there are a couple of MCQs that came up last year on it. And I'll just give you a little sort of taste of what to expect for year three. I think I didn't use this text highlighting thing as much for second year as I did for first year. So I think there's one or two things that I've highlighted that I remember came up on the exams. So next is disclaimer. Again, just let us know if things have changed or things are incorrect. We're always happy for feedback. Next, let's talk about the end of year exam for you guys. So your formative Q&A is obviously your, your Bible. Um, so from what I remember in the exams, there wasn't much. Like I remember, it's, it's, from what I understand, you guys have covered menopause questions, pregnancy questions, neonatal exam questions. I don't remember any of that coming up, but I remember be a diabetes being a thing, maybe even a foot care question, or allied health professionals who would be involved in foot care, something like that. Uh, we did have a question in, in direct, indirect, and intangible costs, and I think that was in this AQ. And there was a strange question on sustainable development goals. Um, and there is one formative Q&A on it, so maybe just have a look at that one if it pops up this year. Um, SAQs will have, as always, a researchy side to them and just their usual wordy side as well. So last year we were given a research abstract, or was it just a paragraph about some kind of research? We had to read that and identify what type of study it was and uh, briefly outline and the biases, I don't think we actually had to analyze the biases in the research study, but specify what biases would apply to this research study, I think. It was, in the end, it ended up being a qualitative um, research study and you had to justify why it was so. And essentially you just wrote down selective selection bias and measurement bias and you know expanded on that. But I think it was a high mark question, something like five marks, if not more. So be ready. Um, and by the way, it might not be qualitative for you this year. This was for us last year. There was a screening program short answer table and that's in your Q&As for this half of the year. So essentially it's similar on diagnostic um, and screening studies teaching from first year, but a little bit more advanced. So just review that. There was some sort of psychosocial table I can't remember what it was. There was the adolescent question on CF. So basically, you know, the psychological um, steps that adolescents go through, uh, such as like body dysmorphia or um, hiding the, their illness. Again, there was a Q&A on that. And there was just a completely random question on the auto declaration or was it the auto charter? I can't remember. It was hard and only people with public health backgrounds could answer that. Um... MCQs will be tough because they assess essentially all of year one and all of year two material to a varying degree. Um, so again, know your basics from first year, your ratios, your study design, your calculating sensitivity and specificity, or just knowing where, how to get them from a table. I think there was one MCQ on institutional racism. There were quite a, a few questions on screening, so breast cancer, HPV, bowel cancer, and then there is no screening for prostate cancer. Um, maybe a couple of questions on immunization program. So like for instance, which one of these um, vaccines is a lab attenuated vaccine? And one of them will be the polio vaccine or something like that. Um, and yeah, a couple of questions on side effects, but I'll, I'll go through that during my slide on immunization. So big exam. All right, next slide is, let's talk about systematic reviews. Um, so I, from third year, I've realized that some people don't fully understand what a systematic review is, which is fair enough. It wasn't really fully properly explained. 
So just looking at the pyramid from like sort of down up, um, you're starting with really broad basic questions down the bottom, such as, you know, petri dish research, testing things on like cell lines, then you advance to mice, then you maybe advance to um, an observation that you've noted in your patients, then you might write up a case report, then you put together a bunch of case reports and make it into a case series, then you advance to a case study, maybe you retrospectively look at your case controls, um, eventually you follow patients uh, prospectively forward in time in a cohort study, and only after that, once you've formulated enough of an evidence base, can you do a randomized control trial, which is your ultimate gold standard for um, understanding whether the intervention actually works. So at the very tip of that pyramid, the, you know, the holy grail, is the systematic review and meta-analyses. And what they do, as the name suggests, is that they systematically review high-quality evidence, which is usually randomized controlled trials, which, you know, not all of them are good ones. And they do it in a, such a systematic way, and then they an analyze it in such a rigorous way, that the outcome is that um, a, a really good evidence to suggest based on the co like the quality of data out there whether something works or not. So obviously, if you have one LCT, um, it's not as good as having twelve that have been analyzed and, and really ex you know the juice of the evidence has been extracted and the essence is presented to you. So systematic reviews are great. Again, not all of them are well done, and in third year we were given an example of a really bad one. Um, so it's definitely worth knowing what a bad one looks like before you see a good one. Um, so yeah, like again, looking at the, the pie chart or the circle, uh, the bunch of circles on the right side, you know, the gray is all of the research articles out there. Um, you know, literature reviews are essentially, when you start a research project, you usually do a literature review, what has been done out there. You're trying to answer a certain question, but you need to first figure out what's been done. So you do a bit of a literature review, like, oh, yeah, so-and-so has done a research in mice on this aspect, and so-and-so has thought about doing it in humans, and, you know, here am I doing sort of my unique contributions. So, for instance, Dr. Barry Marshall, when he, you know, suggested that H. pylori was the cause of ulcers, uh, gastric ulcers, Oh, actually, I don't know if he's done that literature review, but basically there was a Polish doctor years ago, like in early 1900s, who actually found H. pylori in dogs. Unfortunately, you know, non-English literature doesn't get translated to English, so it kind of got lost um, in translation. But essentially that, if, you know, if, if whoever was doing the research in H. pylori could translate all the research papers out there, they would have come across this Polish study. Anyway, I digress. Systematic reviews are more focused than a general literature review. So you see that in the yellow cir circle. And then obviously the orange circle is something more condensed and more heavily analyzed. And that's your systematic review with a meta-analysis. All right, let's go to the next slide. So if you're not familiar with Cochrane, I highly recommend Googling it. And essentially once you Google it, just put in anything that you're interested in. So I remember my, my first experience of Cochrane was um, looking up the efficacy of vitamin C in, in the common cold. Um, and there are plenty of wonderful systematic reviews to show that, you know, it doesn't cure the common cold. Um, also, cranbrain UTI. So, for instance, it doesn't treat the UTIs, but it may help with prevention or something like that. So Cochrane is the gold standard. Cochrane is a collaboration of people who do systematic reviews on the data that's available out there with a really uh, um, rigorous way, a really evidence-based, numbers-oriented, let's look at the best quality evidence and see what it says. So you start with that, and you find, let's say, 700 papers as per this, uh, per this flow chart. And then you screen these 700 papers for something that you're actually looking for. You're looking for, a, you know, only systematic reviews. Or no, maybe you're not looking for systematic reviews. Maybe you're just looking for RCTs. Um, and you're screening that to get what you need. So if we here, eligibility is systematic reviews screened for eligibility. So they're looking for systematic reviews. And they're clearly looking for updated ones, so for instance, ones published in the, you know, in the last five years, 
or um, you know updated on a particular research topic so you can see there is a lot of filtering that happens when you're looking at systematic or, or any um research articles in a systematic way and then you know you started with 700 and you ended up with 300 and even after those you will probably after you read the 300 of them you'll grade them into high quality medium quality and low quality and yeah anyway that's that's more intense than it needs to be but that's essentially what a systematic review is okay next slide this is from dr megan's young clicks on systematic reviews which are quite liked but essentially she's comparing and contrasting what a systematic review is to just a simple literature review for any research paper so if we're looking at the literature review it's about any topic that you want to talk about and it's your choice of references right so when you write a research paper and some of you might be involved in research projects um, in second year and first year you write you select papers that you think are suitable for your research project you don't always document your search st strategy and it's not always comprehensive and you know you don't always appraise your studies you may in the discussion talk about oh yes yeah, so and so talked about this phenomenon and this either agrees or disagrees with my results but there's no systematic approach about it and then it's your judgment whether you how and and whether you talk about certain studies so there's quite a lot of bias involved in you if you write a research article because a lot of it is at your discretion as an author what you write so going back to the systematic review on the left hand side it's a specific question how many papers are there to support this claim and then you have an inclusion and exclusion criteria so i will include papers with the following criteria and i will exclude papers with the following criteria and your inclusion should be quite wide it should be including papers that are non uh, written not only in the english language and papers papers that have not or may not have been published so you know that's quite hard and that's why cochrane does it because they have the resources and your search strategy is documented and what i mean by that is that remember that pico question that i talked about in the first part of the year where you had to write a string uh, or what you would include in the search strategy that's actually something that's documented in systematic reviews they'll actually tell you the words that they entered in the search engine and with what variations um, basically to make it clear that if someone else had to do the same st search strategy they will get a similar result and it has to be replicable and comprehensive so again for somebody else to repeat it and then after they collate all these research articles they then systematically bit by bit analyze every one of them usually you never get too many because if you have a specific question you may start with 500 papers and only 50 or sometimes even 10 are really good enough for what you're trying to do and then again you have a documented way of synthesizing the evidence usually it's a meta-analysis systematic reviews can be without a meta-analysis but a meta-analysis cannot be with a systematic review all right next a bit more about meta-analyses Again, like I mentioned, it can only be done if a systematic review has been done. And it's a method of statistically combining the results of two or more primary quantitative studies. So, for instance, um, if you've done a research on something that's um, under-researched or not much known is known about, and you've generated da a data set that at least has means and standard deviations, and you've published that, Cochrane may actually contact you, you know, if you're the primary author or the, the one that they contact, uh, years down the line for that raw data. So you never delete your raw data, or at least you keep it in, in a de-identified format. And they might actually contact you to say, oh, we're doing this research study, meta-analysis, your study you know, meets our criteria, can you send us your raw data? And what they would do with that data is they would include it into their big statistical um, conglomerate where they analyze you know all of the means and standard deviations of particular studies of which you may be you know contributing to so it's a pretty powerful tool um, and yeah this this sort of stuff happens where Cochrane emails you about your study not always possible to do for instance if you didn't collect means and standard deviations in your part of study and it was very wishy-washy and then you collected some means and then you collected some medians and then you didn't collect you know data at all for sp certain patients Crocom probably wouldn't want that data because it's really hard to um, calibrate to something that's the same 
Okay, and that's again Dr. Megan Young's um, table about benefits and limitations of meta-analyses. So they're quite powerful, they may resolve controversies, they may establish gener generalizability, may be repeated, combine studies, you know, so they have increased power and identify gaps in research. But at the same time, you know, they're not all and be all, be all and end all of all studies, so they may be inconclusive. There may be no primary studies which are RCTs, in which case you can cannot really draw any conclusions from those studies. Um, primary studies may be of poor quality, and that's probably one of the biggest things about meta-analyses is that you really need to, I, can't, I quite like them because you really can dig and, you know, go on, on a bit of a, a hunting expedition and do a bit of detect detective work, but it's really easy to pull apart a bad, bad meta-analysis because it's, once you look at the studies and you realize that the original studies are poor quality, you know that the whole meta-analysis is pretty crappy. So it's easy to, to find bad ones. And again, like, like I said previously, systematic reviews are not immune to bias, especially if it's done by people who are biased in themselves. Next, so the, the key to systematic reviews and primarily meta-analyses is a forest plot. And that's something that we do need to know, what a forest plot is and how to read it. So this, the, the figure on the top right hand corner, um, I think it actually comes from the Q&A questions, the formatives. So just l looking at it briefly, what does it tell us? So on the left hand side it lists um, ref uh, studies that have been included in this meta-analysis and as you can see there aren't many, I think seven. And what else do we see? We see an RR, which is probably a relative risk with 95% confidence intervals. There is weight, and I think weight means percentage of contribution by each study to the model or to the um, meta-analysis. We also see one in the middle, and that makes sense because relative risk, uh, if it equals to one, that means, that means there is no change. So if the confidence interval crosses one, it means it's not significant. So there are two, I can see that cross one, the Flynn and the Rienda et al. Um, so they're not significant. So even though they included part of the study, they're not significant in the model. And then what else? We see an overall, we've got an I squared, something 96.9% and a p-value and weight of 100 opposite the overall. So what does that all mean? So let's do, go bit by bit. Look at the measure of significance. We've, we can have means, we can have relative risk, we can have um, odds ratios. So we here have a relative risk. So one common and how wide confidence interval, intervals are for each study. So we can see that the first one, Osman, is actually quite wide. It's from one to four. Whereas everywhere else, it's quite tight. It doesn't mean go to two. So that's a really wide one. I would look at weight straight away and be like, okay, thank gosh, this, this really vague study with really imprecise sample size only contributes 3% to this whole model. So that's not too bad. And you can, say, you can tell, see, so the, the line that's drawn with the dot in the middle, the dot is the mean, or the, not the mean, sorry, the relative risk. And the edges of that, um, the line drawn through the relative risk is the confidence interval. So you can see that's it's huge, right? It's really wide, so it's imprecise. We looked at weighting, uh, pulled result, look at, look at overall. So we're looking at the overall. Okay, is this statistically significant? Ignore the I squared for now in brackets. Look to the relative risk, 1.1. Well, that's not one, that's greater than one. So, and the CI or the confidence interval doesn't cross one, so it is significant. So what that means is this pull result is significant from all of the studies that they've looked at. And it favors one, or is greater than one, which means um, these studies increase mortality. Whatever that they're studying, there is definitely an effect towards increased mortality. Okay, and then, yeah, so we've talked about the pulled result. And then we can also, it's, it's, it's a bonus if you look at the I squared. I actually don't know how to pronounce properly, maybe it has a proper name. But essentially it 
it's a measure of heterogeneity. So if it's less than 25%, it means studies are homogeneous and that there isn't very much variation within the studies, which means it's good, right? Like the more variation there is in the studies, the more likely you are to get like a bad result or a non-precise result. And if it's higher than 75%, the heterogeneity is high. And usually in meta-analyses, um, there's usually like a paragraph um, in the results section discussing why it is so and how they try to um, fix it using certain statistical analyses. So in our bad statistical um, review, uh, sorry, systematic review paper in third year that we were using as a practice run, their I squared was zero, and they were claiming that out of the five studies that they've looked at, and they were claiming that there was, you know, they were 100% homogeneous, those studies, which was just a complete load of crap. That's impossible. Like, I would rather look at a study that's good, that's honest about their heter heterogeneity, than tries to hide it statistically and say that it's zero. So the extremes always should make you question things. And things always tend to be more disordered than they are ordered, so... Trust a study that's messy more than a study that looks weirdly neat. Anyway, let's go to the next slide. Um, I really like this slide. It explains a lot about forest plots um, in quite a quite detailed way. Uh, you, you will probably never get a detailed picture like this, but um, at least you'll know if you see one, you'll know what that means. So going from the top left corner in a clockwise direction, so... You've got your study IDs, usually it's, you know, author, last name, et al. Up top it might explain what they're actually looking at. Not all studies do that, intervention group and control group, but it's nice if they do. And with the numbers that they presented, it's nice to see the contribution, the N numbers of each, of each study in, in each group. Then you look at the, you know, the actual graph relative risk usually or whatever they present and they usually present uh, confidence intervals and this is your outcome effect and like, like they say it's shown graphically and numerically then you've got your weight you always have your weight and you can always um, comment on the weight and I like commenting on weight because that's not something people look at but let's have a look so again study C really wide confidence intervals but very little weighting which is good in, in that instance and then a very tight confidence interval and in study B and quite a significant weighting, 77%. I always feel a bit concerned when a study contributes more than 50% or even 50% to the weighting, especially if there are only a couple of studies. That essentially means that it's only one study that's um, responsible for the outcome in this particular meta-analysis. And you want a couple, right? If you're looking at a meta-analysis, you want at least five or seven studies maybe more, maybe 10, and all contributing small amounts to an overall picture. When you see a study that's contributing a lot or too little, you kind of start to wonder why is it there. And then, yeah, numerical representation of re relative risk. It'll give you the actual number of the relative risk and the confidence interval in brackets. We talked about the overall effect. It's always down the bottom, and they'll always tell you what that overall effect is in a number form. And down the bottom, below the forest plot, it'll tell you whether it favors intervention or control, or favors mortality, um, increased mortality or decreased mortality. Sometimes it's not always obvious and you have to really fish for it. Um, we talked about heterogeneity, diversity between studies, and usually there's an accompanying p-value uh, for the overall effect but again I don't see that often so don't worry about it so again it's a deconstructed version of what we talked about in the previous slide and there is a reference um, to this image I think it was written in Australian family on oh no, American family practitioner website about basically how to interpret meta-analyses all right next slide systematic reviews critical appraisal so fairly straightforward to do. They don't actually have any specific biases that we need to look out for. The biggest problem with critical appraisals is, is actually missing relevant studies or not doing a, a thorough search of the studies and not appraising them appropriately. So first things first, you want to have, to have a specific question. So it has to fit PICO. And then you look at the studies. Have they got a documented search strategy? Have they used multiple search engines? 
Ideally, when they search, you want them to use PubMed and Embase because they have different search strings or different, what are they called? Oh, they're called um, subject headings. So PubMed uses Mesh and Embase uses Mtree and it's basically different ways of coding topics, which means that each database will give you slightly different um, papers if you put in the same search terms. So again, that's important. So use a couple of these, use Cochrane, use clinical trials, the more the merrier basically. And then the two things that people get tripped up on in M MCQs, and these come up in MCQs, is that if there is no language, uh, if, well, maybe I should rephrase that, there shouldn't be any language restriction. Um, when you're doing a systematic review, you cannot just look at the English language studies. You have to look at the foreign language studies. And that's why Cochrane does these big reviews, because they have the capability to employ or ask people from various countries to translate um, research studies. Um, but yeah, in English language studies is a big one. Obviously, as part of any systematic review, you manually search reference lists of all included studies to make sure you haven't missed anything. And another one that people forget is search of unpublished grey literature. So for a good systematic review, you have to do that. So what that means is looking at conference abstracts. So a lot of research is first presented in conferences, right, in an abstract form before it um, becomes a paper. Oftentimes, more common than not, these abstracts never see the light of day in the paper form. They just remain abstracts. But it's still important data. So you still need to include it into your systematic review. So a lot of conference abstracts are mini research projects have been that have been done and condensed into an abstract, but a paper hasn't been written. And also contacting your fellow researchers. So people would email, you know, there are always a per there is always a person out there who's the lead in a particular area of research. And, you know, academia is so nice where people can just email each other and say, hey, what are you researching at the moment? Do you have any unpublished data that we can include in our systematic review? Again, people tend to be more responsive if it comes from Cochrane because they're big collaboration and they're very well respected. Either way, when you're reading a systematic review, that's something important to note that has or hasn't been done. Another important thing is having at least two independent reviewers um, going through the um, sort of the initial searching of the papers. Um, so he, he, let's say we had you know three medical students using this search strategy and um, searching through um, reference lists of studies and they came up with a total of 900 papers. And then there should be another two independent reviewers or well, at least let's say maybe there is one person who went, goes through all of these 900 papers and goes through an exclusion and, and an inclusion criteria and it ends up with only 200. Another person, an independent person, should go through the same list and get the same result or at least if there is discrepancy they need to agree on, on a particular number. And then that goes, basically every time you do something in research that requires sorting, an independent person should do it again. Or at least maybe you can do it at the same time, but two independent people do it, if that makes sense. Basically, look for the keywords. Two independent reviewers is really important. Um, methods of critical appraisal. So, you know, a, a, an accepted appraisal tool has been used and evidence of, um, of appraisal has been evaluated. So I'm going to talk about the equator network a bit later on in the third year part. But using an approved checklist is great, but also assessing quality of the study based on a particular approved tool is also important. And I think that will be in the checklists. But essentially, once you have your 200 papers, you need to somehow um, systematically analyze them for quality of evidence before you include them in your um, meta-analysis or your whatever ap appraisal. So some way of appraising these articles is important. And again, keep bringing up this 30-year paper that was awful. Um, they didn't do a really good job. I think they just did like a three by four matrix of like this study has good selection criteria or this study, it was really vague. And it, like, it made it look like all the studies were excellent. But when you actually went and looked at the studies specifically, they actually were quite, you know, not, didn't make much sense at all. 
so you can make it look pretty and say that they're nice but always have a have the suspicion what if they're trying to hide something um, Heritage Jane and AD explored, I already talked about it, a fair explored and then make sure you pay attention to weighting, confidence intervals and the I squared. And essentially when you do talk about validity, you essentially talk about just the selection bias and selection bias here is selecting the papers and critically appraising them. So next is, yeah, I'm, there's not much, not much I can talk about biases for systematic reviews and meta-analyses. Um, there is a selection bias, which is not doing a systematic or rigorous search of the literature and not appraising it properly. And that's essentially all you'll need to do if you ever have to do this in third year. I don't think they'll give you a systematic review in second year. We actually didn't even get a forest plot in second year at the end of second year. So maybe that's something they're saving up for third year. But nonetheless, important to know about. For your interest, there is a a website called, called catalogofbias.org and it has two more biases that might be associated with systematic reviews which is publication bias and detection bias but they're fairly vague and possibly low yield and maybe that's something you would want to include in your third year appraisal but don't worry about it for now. Okay next would be qualitative studies. So I talked about qualitative studies um, in the second part of year one review which should be published soon to youtube i only spent one slide on it again i don't think there is much to talk about in terms of qualitative studies i say that but i had to do a qualitative critical appraisal in third year which shocked me because i wasn't ready for it so okay let's go through the, through the critical appraisal for qualitative studies you have to do a PICO even though there might not be um, an intervention or a control. It might just be a population and an outcome. Um, and essentially you're trying to figure out if this research question fits the what and the why question. So what do people do when they receive this diagnosis? Or why do people react in such a way when they you know, receive a cancer diagnosis? They're big, big, broad questions trying to understand why things happen. And then you move on to research design and recruitment strategy, which is actually really important in qualitative studies. How you sample is really important. Do they use criterion? Do they use snowball? Do they use situation? Are these actually appropriate for what they're trying to study? So the paper that I did for third year uh, for ex in, in exam conditions was um, an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, qualitative study where they recruited patients um, with a cancer diagnosis or family and friends with a cancer diagnosis. And the way that they recruited them, I think, was in community halls and centres. Um, and I think they recruited something like 15 people. It wasn't a lot of people. And it kind of made me wonder because they're recruiting people who can read and they're recruiting people who, can, who go to community centres. What about all the, about all the other people who don't go to community centres and who don't read? So I felt like their sampling was lacking. And I think theirs was very opportunistic. But I think maybe something like a saturation or snowball where people recruit other people through, through word of mouth. And I think they did use word of mouth, but I don't think it was strong enough in that particular paper. But sampling is something that can ruin your paper and that's always easy to talk about, even in qualitative in methods, so people can use a quite a semi-structured method, like an interview or something that's free-flowing, such as field notes, where you just kind of observe what happens in front of you without actually interacting much with, with people. Or you can have a group process, such as a focus group, which is what my paper talked about. Focus groups are great. Again, very little structure involved. Um, so you can always talk about the pros and cons interviews versus focus groups and whether it's appropriate for that study. Data collection, so essentially they need to describe how they've collected data, they need to provide the data, transcripts, maybe trees of how they've built or trying to build a theme. And the most important one for biases is actually researcher particip participant and relationship. So in qualitative studies a researcher is always quite involved with the participants, be it through observation or through group processes, 
there is a, an establishment of trust a lot of the times. Uh, the participant needs to trust the researcher with search certain information. And that's where research ref 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 reflexivity and reflexive journal comes in. So the reflexive journal is a journal that a researcher leads about their thoughts and feelings about the research that they're conducting. And it should be an ongoing critique and critical reflection of their own biases that they're bringing into the research project. So it's not to say that there is never any bias in qualitative studies. There is always some. But your goal as a researcher should always be to minimize it. Um, and that's essentially the buzzwords that you need to see in a qualitative study, or at least the buzzwords that you can use um, to outline that they're potential sources of bias. Triangulation is uh, using multiple methods or data sources, um, and member checking is actually participants of the research study can check interpretation of the data and sort of confirm, agree or disagree with you. Ethical issues, there is a lot, especially in the Aboriginal and Torres, Strait, Torres Strait Islander research. And I'm just going to leave it at that, because once you come across that in the year three, you can do more reading. And data analysis, make sure there are no numbers. It's all about meaning and themes and theories and deducing from a, a whole lot of data something that makes sense must be organized and structured. Software is usually used and there are multiple people and approaches to make it work. So that's sort of qualitative studies in a nutshell. Next, I just wanted to give you an example of what a checklist looks like for a qualitative study bias. And this is the sort of ch checklist I ended up using in year three to appraise my study. And if you go to number eight, after relationship with participants, it says, what characteristics were reported by the interviewer and facilitator? Bias, assumptions, reasons, interest in the research topic. This particularly is really important in the, in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, research because if you're, non -an if you're an, a non-Aboriginal researcher who does Aboriginal research, your motivations and your biases and assumptions are always questions. Why are you doing it? What's your connection? Um, do you have an understanding of this topic? How did you achieve that understanding? So there's a lot to unpack there. Um, if you look down at domain two, study design, participant selection, 10 to 13, all of these are potential sources of biases as well. How were the participants selected? How were they approached? How many participants were in the study? So like I mentioned in my study, there were about 15 people, which I don't think is not nearly enough for what you need. And non-participation, how many people refuse to participate? Again, that's lost to follow up. Yes, it's a little bit qualitative, uh, quantitative, but it's still important to know why certain people decided not to participate. So again, more important for year three, but just teaching you that there are biases associated with qualitative studies. They're just um, hidden in checklists. Next, so I've just kind of deduced what I was saying into something that's more palatable, selection bias. You can talk about sampling, sample size, non-participation, and measurement bias and qualitative studies. You can talk about research rec reflexivity and appropriate methodological frameworks. Um, this is the next slide coming up with biases in the exam. So <laughs> essentially there is selection bias and there is measurement bias, right? There are two that you can talk about. And sometimes that's good enough to put down in year one, but in year two, they actually want you to give, uh, they want you to give them specifics. So let's say you have a mind blank and you can't come up with any. You've, forgot all of, you've forgotten all of them. You can start by thinking about selection. Selection is how you select people for studies. So first one you can say is there's poor recruitment or sampling. They didn't recruit enough patients or didn't, they didn't recruit the right patients. There's not enough. Sampling's too lax or too restrictive or it's just simply not appropriate. There is loss to follow up. That's always bad. ICTs tolerate only 20% of loss to follow up. Usually it's around 40 to 50%. So, you know, these people who drop out usually are either unmotivated or too sick and they're the piece before you want to be in studies because they're the ones who visit the public health care system on a regular basis. And yeah, we talked about non-representative sample, which is again recruiting people who are too sick or recruiting them from tertiary centres versus GP practices. 
uh, measurement bias. So you can always comment on the tools that they're using to measure things, right? Tools are not objective or standardized enough or they're not validated. There are unmeasured confounders. They don't talk about age or gender, which can always explain things. So basically, if you've got a bunch of people recruited for a study and they're just too sick, they're always just too sick and they're all 80 years old. Well, you, you know why age explains it. By the, age of, by the age of 80, you're always just too sick. So sometimes age or gender can explain your results better than anything else that you can come up with, which is also unfortunate in a way if you do research. People bias, recall bias, people sitting there and trying to recall when they got sick last time. That's a really unreliable way to do things. Observer bias, a person who's observing a patient um, to do something or to say something. Again, the person who's, ob who's observing is prone to error. Interviewer bias, a person who's leading an interview with a, p a patient or a participant. If they're not highly trained in a really structured interview, they're bound to make mistakes and introduce bias. This can apply to both qualitative and quantitative studies. With RCTs, it's easy if there is no randomization or blinding, it's a shit RCT. Diagnostic studies are a bit more tricky and I would advise you to go back and look at them more closely if you want, but I think, I don't think they're going to come up at the end of second year, they're more something year three is going to talk about. So essentially not testing everyone with the gold standard, that's a verification bias, or including the gold standard in your analysis of the screening test which is your incorporation bias, and there is plenty more, but I'll leave that for you. Next. Okay, so that's done. We're done. Next is immunization. We're done with um, all of the critical, uh, critical appraisals for the year. Great. All right, immunizations. Um, just wanted to briefly touch upon these three points because I saw them in the exam last year and in the past medical and, and in the past um, exam papers. So um, DHC likes their live, atten live attenuated vaccines, the MMR, varicella, maybe polio as well. So what are the contraindications for giving these vaccines? Because they're live attenuated, they can mount a really strong immunity response. So that's why if you've got impaired immunity, um, you're immunosuppressed or you're pregnant, you don't get those vaccines because they can mess you up, right? They shouldn't be administered within four weeks of each other and they sh uh, other vaccines should not be administered four weeks after the live attenuated vaccine. This should all ring a bell, especially if in first year you went through the nightmare of getting all your vaccinations up to date, um, especially if you've got the M MMR, M the MMR, sorry. Um, Okay, so what would be the absolute contraindications to non-live attenuated vaccines? For instance, the flu vaccine. Essentially, there are none except anaphylaxis. So if you have anaphylaxis to a vaccine component or a previous dose, that's an absolute contraindication. You cannot get that vaccine again. But other than that, there is essentially nothing else. And I think there was an MCQ on that. Um... I can't remember what it was, but it had something to do with, with these two things, so definitely um, keep it in mind. And yeah, common side effects, I think there was maybe a question I'm in the MCQ about a, a worried mom coming um, to see a GP about a, um, a possible complication of a vaccine where the kid's arm was red and, and swollen and he was feverish and, you know, she's... She wants you to code it as a potential side effect of that vaccine. And your job is to reassure and say it's completely fine. All right, next. I think we're, this is essentially the end of the presentation. A few more exam tips for this coming exam. The formative Q&As for this part of the year are quite wordy. So that's, you know, to be expected in, in the short answer questions for the exam. Um... So be ready. Commit certain concepts to memory. Biases are going to be accept, uh, assessed in some shape or form in the exams. So just know a couple. Um, do past exam questions. This is the same advice I gave to the first years. Um, remember a few key biases for each study design. Don't be afraid to answer MCQs with common sense. But I think in this part of the year, um, MCQs do require prior knowledge and understanding of concepts. So studying is essential, but not too much, just, you know, within reason. Formative Q&As is what you need um, and a few stats concepts. 
There will always be hard and strange questions to the alma mater question last year. It was just out of nowhere and I think it was only worth two marks. So, if, you know, do your best, write something down, but don't don't dwell on it. And um, I, I think Michael or I have shared... Um, links to the drop not dropbox the google drive for gums folder that has all the resources for year one and two um so i've just dropped in the super notes for year one and two compiled into one document and i think there is a year two anchor deck as well that you can access um if you can't find the link we'll send we'll, we'll share it again um for this part of the year but again if this doesn't work for you don't do it make your own stuff um, whatever works for you. All right, next slide. Note for year threes, uh, or for year three in general. <sighs> you will have to appraise one paper in exam conditions. And in 2019, the life before COVID, um, third years were given th six papers to read and appraise in their own time. Um, I think it was at the beginning of the year. This was semester one of year three. And then in exam conditions in June, they had to sit down and they were given, you know, luck of the draw, they were given a paper to appraise out of the six that they were getting, given at the beginning of the year. And the job was for you to regurgitate whatever you remembered from appraising them at home and put it on paper. Needless to say, <laughs> there were quite bad appraisals. Um, so hopefully the 2020 approach will continue on for next year. So because of COVID, we were given six papers, uh, a qualitative, an RCT, a cohort, a systematic review with a meta-analysis, a diagnostic study, and a case control. Actually, it was something else to the case control. It was really weird, something verification study. Um, but six papers. And um, we were give, we were, we analyzed them in journal club um, week by week with, with Dr. Kathy Heathcott. Um, she was really good. She tried really hard to give us the best resources. Um, so we together and an critically uh, learned to critically appraise these papers. And then in June we were given essentially forty eight hours uh, we were, uh, to appraise a paper, um, one of three. So we were given a very similar paper to the ones that we looked at for the six papers. So, for instance, um, I think the three papers that they selected was a qualitative, an RCT, and a cohort. And then the qualitative paper was on um, Aboriginal people and cancer. The RCT was on, I can't remember actually. It was either beta blockers or tonsillectomies or something like that. And the cohort was on cancer in some Danish registry. So that's the ones that they gave us to look at prior to the exam. And essentially what Kathy did is that she gave us virtually the same content of papers, but just a different author for the exam conditions. So on the day of the exam at 9am, we woke up, we opened a folder of of a paper that we got allocated randomly, one out of three. And I got a qualitative paper which was to do with Aboriginal people and cancer, but it wasn't the same paper as we analyzed previously, but it was quite similar. So we had the same knowledge base, we just had a different paper. And we had 48 hours to um, appraise it, which I thought was quite enough. So it gave you the option to go back and to listen to the journal clubs, to review the checklists and all that sort of stuff. Some people said there wasn't enough time, um, so maybe they'll take that into account for next year, or maybe they'll change it completely and you guys will have something else. But that's sort of to give you an idea what to expect for next year. I think the most important thing that I took out of this whole exercise is using checklists. Um, each study design has its own recommended checklist, um, and I found them quite useful because they kind of show you the gold standard of what they expect in a really, really good study. And then based on that checklist, it makes it easier to then tear apart a paper. Um, if The only one other piece of advice I can give you is that reading research papers is not your strong point. Then definitely listen and attend the journal clubs, ask lots of questions and learn from others. Um, and keep track. 
discuss things with others and like I did do not ne neglect qualitative papers because I had to do a lot of studying um, of that kind of research in the 48 hours when I had to do my paper all right these are the image acknowledgments I think one of them I wanted to point out but I can't remember for the meta-analysis paper that breaks it down really nicely but it's one of these links and lastly good luck guys um yeah best of luck in dhc i hear you have 70 percent of examinable material for this year to, to be assessed in um, end of year exams so i hope these these lectures have been useful if they haven't let us know we'll change things um but yeah good luck